that was to enter into the matter, but now this is the core of it. So we have a session only on industry perspective where we'll have a talk from Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. So the first speaker is actually my big boss. He's a VP of AI at Facebook, and one of the top priority is uh, AI for integrity. And uh, this is Jérôme Pesanti, who uh, previously was in IBM Watson, and uh, then was in London for a few years uh, as CEO of Benevolent AI, and now he will speak about AI for integrity at Facebook. Thank you, Guillaume. All right, good morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, how Facebook uses AI to make its platform safer. Uh, my name is Jerome Pesanti, and I lead the AI team at Facebook. Now, when I come on stage like this, uh, I usually give a talk about the great new advances that my team makes and all the cool technology they were developing and how it's going to make you dream about the, the future. Today is going to be a little less glamorous, uh, but not less interesting. I'm going to talk about how we use AI to solve a problem of today that there is no other way to solve than using AI. It's quite a lot of pressure, actually, for me and for my team. Uh, the work I'm going to show you is actually work done by thousands of people, uh, thousands of employees at Facebook, who every day wake up thinking out how they're going to solve this next challenge, and I'll show you they are quite difficult. Many of them actually are in the room today. Uh, Guillaume is one of them, and you know, please you know, take the time during the break to talk to them. They'll tell you a lot more about this than I do, and in much deeper and, uh, and better details. So what does that mean to make Facebook safer? We have actually identified 10 categories of violating content. So this is a list of them, spam, violent, hate speech, drug. Uh, for each of them, the goal is pretty simple. We are trying to make sure that as little of that uh, gets in front of users while not taking down non-violating content. Right? And we are trying to do that proactively as much as possible. So when you put a piece of content out there, we have artificial intelligence that analyze that content and try to determine, is it violating the policies of these 10 classes of content? And if so, it will either take it down or cue it for a moderator to uh, look at. Sometimes users will actually report that content and it goes through the same queue. Now, we're trying to be pretty open about this process and show to the world what progress we're making. So every six months, there is actually a, a report that shows you know, how, much, how well we're doing around our community standards. So for each of these categories, we tend to publish the number of actions we have taken, the percentage of the action that were done proactively. And for some of these categories, we are trying to estimate the prevalence on our platform. So I encourage you to look at that report. Today, I'm going to show you a few of these numbers. So the first set of numbers is how many actions are we taking? It's quite interesting to see the magnitude of the problem. So the set of problem on the left there is spam and fake accounts. You're talking about billions of actions every quarter. So obviously, this needs to be done by a computer. It cannot be done by uh, humans only. The next set of actions, nudity, violence, you're talking about tens of millions of actions uh, a quarter. And then you're looking at millions of actions for the others. Now, this is a bit misleading because some of these categories you know, we have a much harder time understanding the prevalence uh, of this problem, like hate speech. And it's much likely that it's much greater than the number of actions we're taking. Another view uh, of the problem is, for all these actions, how many of them were taken proactively versus reactively after a user reported them? So you can see for many of these categories, a majority, great majority of the actions are taken by AI. Okay, by uh, an analysis of the problem automatic. Some of them, you can see we have more challenges, like hate speech and harassment. Uh, and even for this, again, this slide may be a little bit misleading because it only talks about the action. But we know for something like hate speech that the prevalence is much greater than what's reported by user, which means that our rate of action that are automatic is actually not appropriate at the moment. And we're still working on this. Now, luckily, Facebook has been working on AI for the past five years. Actually, the team that I'm leading today, which I've been leading for the past 18 months, has been creating, uh, created five years ago. So we've been working on AI uh, for the past five years. And initially, the idea was not to tackle these problems. 
But amazingly, a majority of the techniques that we have developed to understand text, to understand images, video, I'll show you that in a minute, are actually very useful uh, to tackle this kind of content moderation problem. And I would say that a majority of the technology we've developed has been put to use to, do, uh, this kind, to solve these kind of problems. Another way to look at our progress, this slide shows actually for each of the category of violating content, at what year, at what moment, we've started to be more proactive than reactive. So you can see that for the, these six categories there, we are now more proactive than we are reactive. And it's true for a majority, actually, of the content we take down and the categories we take down, that we do that more proactively through AI than reactively. Now, I want to now show you some example of action that we're taking. I want to show you some example of violating content. Uh, I can tell you that this content in general is truly awful, but I'm not going to show you the truly awful content, so I'm going to focus on some interesting examples, exactly, especially that show the adversarial nature of the problem. You know, it's a bit of an arm race uh, with some of our bad actors and bad users on the platform, but I'm going to use a bit more innocuous, uh, just a piece of content that actually violates our ad policy, but it's not truly awful in this case. So, this is an ad uh, from uh, pre-2015. So in the pre-AI days, people would actually put ads like this, uh, you know, advertising, in this case, marijuana, right? And we had some pretty basic tools at the time. What we could do is look at behavioral uh, uh, aspects. For example, is this actor, has, has this advertisement been flagged in the past? Uh, do they come from an IP or a region that has caused problems in the past, right? Unfortunately, these kind of techniques are very easy to go around, right? An advertiser can create a new account. Uh, they can spoof their IP to make it look they come from somewhere else. So we had other techniques related to content, but they were very rudimentary, like looking at keywords like drug or marijuana. As you can imagine, it was really easy for people to go around that. And the real way to solve this problem was actually to look at the pictures. Now, pre-2015, we didn't have the technology to identify that this was marijuana, but in 2015, we started using computer vision to be able to identify that. Now, as you can imagine, once we were able to do this, people found ways to go beyond it. They started to show some pictures that were not obviously marijuana. So I'm going to do a little test for you here. One of these pictures is marijuana. The other one is Fred Boccoli. Okay? So let's see if you're smarter than the computer. Who thinks that picture on the right, or my right, is marijuana? Okay. Who thinks that picture on the left is marijuana? Okay, all computers are smarter than you guys. So the right one is, for me, is marijuana. And we have actually a computer system that's able to identify that today. So computer vision has made a lot of progress in the past five years to really understand subtle aspect of uh, images to be able to do this. Now, once again, uh, people have found a way to go around this. It's not just enough to, they, they don't have to show marijuana, they can show packaging. Every single picture here illustrates an ad for marijuana. You wouldn't know it, right? But uh, once you see one, you can kind of figure out the pattern. This is where we actually created a system, a computer system that's able to do exactly this. You show it some examples that you know are violating your policy, and it's able to find similar examples out of billions of images in just tens of milliseconds. So now our system is called Kraken, is able actually to identify, once we give them an example, similar patterns uh, out of images and to be able to catch this kind of problem. But even then, people are able to go beyond this. Often, there are actually posts where to really understand that people are advertising for marijuana, you need to combine the image, which here looks like Rice Krispie, and the text, which like, hey, it's a put on batch, $8. Mm, I guess you don't really sell Rice Krispie like this uh, uh, over the internet, right? So for this, we actually created a system that tries to interpret the whole post all together. It's actually using pretty sophisticated uh, neural network algorithm. It's done actually by uh, uh, a team that's actually here today. I don't know if Patrick, are you here? Maybe you can raise your hand. Patrick is there. If you want to talk to him, he's much uh, smarter than I am, and he can tell you actually how these things work. But the way it's done is that you create one single network that will take all the signal at the same time, behavioral signal, uh, the text, the image, 
uh, the OCR techs analyze that all together and train a system to try to recognize that this is a validating post all together. And Patrick can tell you all about it. One thing I want to highlight, one challenge, you know, I talked a lot about images before. Text is also extremely challenging. So these are actually as for sexual solicitation. Hard to know, but once you see the pattern, today we're actually able to create system using these very large language models. You may have heard them, names like Elmo and Bert, uh, who are actually able to analyze huge amount of text and understand very subtle nuance of that text to be able to catch things like this. Now, even this becomes even harder, as you can imagine, because we're not just doing this in English. We are doing this in 100 plus languages. And just today, actually, my team told me that we were able to create a system that analyze all these languages at the same time to understand text across all the languages. We call that cross-language understanding, to be able to have this subtle understanding of uh, uh, nuance and meaning across all these languages. So, as you can tell, this is an arm race. Uh, we are making progress, but obviously our adversaries are making progress, and we are just, we keep going at it. Now, to finish my presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about a, a problem that's a little bit closer to the theme of this uh, conference. I'm going to see, to, today I talked about the violating content, but there's a whole category of content that's what I would call borderline. It's not strictly violating, but it's not really bringing the right information to you, right? It's misinformation. Uh, the same techniques I mentioned can be used and even more advanced. I'll talk now about one specific set of problems that is very top of mind for us today and that just occur. It's called deepfakes. Now, this is an example of using AI, AI creates the problem, not just solve it, because now using AI, we're able to actually create videos that are very much lifelike by changing, for example, the face of the person. This is an example of that where you can take one picture, you attach it to a video, an existing video, and you change the face of the person. Imagine if that picture is one of a famous person, right? Uh, uh, a politician or an actor, the problem that it could create. In some cases, it could be entertaining. You know, you could put your face on top of an action movie, but in some cases, it could be really disturbing misinformation. Now, this problem, unfortunately, is not just a technical problem, right? It's also a policy problem. It's a communication problem. It's a legal problem. You know, how we're going to address this is not just technology, but technology is also part of it. So we are trying to develop system to identify this kind of video. Now, we believe uh, that we cannot do that on our own, and that's why we just launched the deepfake uh, challenge. And as for this conference today, we are really trying to get the community to look at this problem and help, them solve, uh, help us solve them. So I really hope that you're going to enjoy the conference today. We're counting on you to solve this problem. If you're interested in deepfake, we can tell you a lot more about it. Uh, but I know you're going to actually address things around misinformation, trust, and truth online. So enjoy your conference. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you. So we have time for questions. Um, thank you. It was really an enlightening uh, presentation. <clears throat> I come from a journalism background. I teach uh, at Sedator University in Sweden. And one thing that we are focusing on having collaboration between journalists <clears throat> who do fact checks on the ground and produce content that is really investigated properly in the proper way and with social media because many times over social media messages that have uh, been rumored or let's say spread apart all over the world actually have been debunked but the problem is that there's really no connection between the fact checkers and the uh, social media I know there's a, a project and uh, by Facebook and partnering with the ch fact checkers. Uh, but we've also been in interested in having a wider network so that not only those who are partners with Facebook, but others around the world. I mean, we have a, a project going on. It's the second uh, day on a poster on how to use blockchain as one alternative, one method. We always try new things. And so um, I wonder if this might be one avenue that you can consider. Sure. So Today, actually, Facebook does partner with fact checkers. Actually, we have a, a queue that when a piece of content comes in, we actually flag it using AI and we queue it for them to identify. Unfortunately, I would say it's, it's a pretty low uh, throughput queue. So you're looking at tens or hundreds of pieces of content uh, a day. So we're try also trying to partner 
with a fact checker to make them more effective. For example, if you identify a piece of content or a fact or a claim that's inaccurate, then we can apply that to all the instances of this claim uh, in other you know, uh, web pages or instances or URLs. So we're really trying to partner. We're trying to make the community more effective. We're trying to do that not just us. We're trying to also partner with other of our peers to make that more effective. So that's a big topic for us. It's emerging. We're trying to partner. So I would encourage you to actually talk people here and talk people here at Facebook, uh, who actually many of them will know better. than I know more than the AI side of things, but there's a whole process there when we try to engage uh, fact checkers. Hi, Mike Westcott, TALIS. Um, in the news, we've just been hearing about um, uh, the potential for Facebook to start encrypting all messages. What's the impact for AI and doing analysis on encrypted messages for you? That's a very good question. Um, so I think there are two challenge, sets of challenges there. There is the technology and there is the policy. Okay. Uh, I would say at the moment, the biggest challenge are more on the policy aspect. So if we encrypt your messages, what does it mean that we can see? Right? Uh, obviously, we cannot see anything on the server. That's the, the key of end-to-end -end encryption, like with WhatsApp today. Uh, Facebook has no access to the content on the server. But it doesn't mean we can't do anything. So first we can look at the behavioral signal, and we could actually do a lot more things on the device. But there's a big discussion that needs to happen here between privacy advocates and the people who are concerned about safety. And honestly, for me, I would like that to be solved you know, by people. It's not a Facebook problem. It's like really very much of a what is acceptable, what is good for our users, uh, how, what is privacy? What does it mean to respect privacy? So there's this big balance between privacy and safety. There are actually technical solutions. You could actually do AI on device, but then would people call that still private? And what do you do when you actually identify a piece of content that's violating? So it's really, for now, a discussion that needs to happen between these people. I would say I'm, I feel like I'm in the middle of it, and I'd like to help. We can do things, but we need to solve this problem, policy problem first. Hey, um, thank you very much. Uh, speaking of, of policy, um, I want to know in terms of the, the enforcement side or the sort of recommendation side on misinformation and disinformation content specifically. So if I remember correctly, it wasn't one of the 10 categories no. right, for an automatic right. kind of takedown. Um, that, would it make sense for you actually to completely remove something or just flag it or you know, contact the, 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 the uploader of the information. So how, how would you approach the, that side? Again, it's a very difficult problem. So there are multiple actions that can be taken. One is to remove the content entirely, right, which is what I highlighted today. And the reason I started from this, because it's a little simpler, actually, to think this. You know, if the content is truly awful, we want to take it down. And I wanted to highlight the techniques that we wanted to do. After that, you can flag it, and you can decide not to let it go viral. And you can demote it. And there's these things called soft demotion or hard demotion. Hard demotion being, you know, it's on your page, but you have to go there to see it. Soft demotion is that we don't try to promote it in your feed, but it can still be there. So the different classes of action uh, that we need to take. I think for misinformation, in my opinion, in most of the cases, you know, removing the content creates more controversy than benefits at the end. So I think looking at this other demotion and being transparent about it is the best way to do this. Uh, obviously, we are working with fact checkers, as I mentioned, right? So there's a whole process to get there. And then we're going to have the appeal board as well, right? So that was put together. Ultimately, and it sounds, you know, you know we, are, we don't want to make this decision. You know, ideally, there is a societal decision to say, this is the kind of content we want, this is what it means, and we'd rather people tell us what to do than, than decide ourselves, because then it's very controversial. Maybe one last question. Uh, Jérôme, um, what about if we combine AI, fact checkers, journalists, and startups? The question is, let's, take, let's not take Broccoli. Let's take uh, a uh, breaking news that will impact a brand. Let's just say the brand is Facebook, so that, that way you can relate to it. Let's just say that uh, there's breaking news that Sheryl Sandberg is tired of this whole thing, and there's a deep fake video that she's leaving and she's going to work for um, Elizabeth Warren. 
how long will it take this group of people to fact check this deep fake? Five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds? And you guys could immediately say, yeah, there's a dynamic veracity index from all those people who understand deep fakes, not the machine necessarily, but the machine can also help compete with the, the, the experts. AI plus the experts who know Sheryl Sandberg, who know Elizabeth Warren, who know Facebook, uh, they say it's 99% bullshit, it's not happening. And then you can stop the propagation of this deep fake. What do you think of an approach like this, combining the best of human and AI? So actually, that's what we do today, right? So to be clear, actually, we use a combination of uh, AI, uh, content moderator, which are actually people that we recruit ourselves, right? And then fact checker, who are independent fact checkers. So this is actually a process that exists today. The challenge is scaling it. And the throughput right now of the fact checking and the latency is not 30 seconds. You know, you're talking, and the way we do it, because we're trying to respect also their will, which means that we enqueue the content, they choose what they review. So we don't tell the fact checker which of this content. So at the moment, the problem is that it's not real time. It's difficult to set a process like that in time. So it takes time for it to be identified and to close the loop, unfortunately. So this is the idea. The idea is to try to solve this. How to operate that more effectively with lower latency, higher throughput is something that we're still working on. And it will be interesting to hear more ideas around this. I think we're done okay. now. Yes. Thank you very much for listening to me and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Joe. So now I'm